All right, well, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Hope y'all are doing well. Um, if I at any point mop my brow, just forgive me. Um, we're in Alabama. So I wanna thank um, Aaron and Lynn and the whole Department of English and the, I'm gonna get the name wrong, Civil Rights to Civic Virtue team um, for putting this event together. I'm gonna begin with a poem. Imagine us in love with the world. I want to tell you a story about love, about peace. Some days, long before today, I would wake to hear the wind rustling my parents' voices as they sipped coffee and settled into the morning of their love. I could hear the redbirds draw close to carefully puncture the air with their calls. The soft movement of house clothes against the metal patio chairs. The intake of coffee like a suction. The pause as they let it steam down their throats. The sun stretching against the backyard plants. Days like these, all I did was stand and wait. I'd listen. What could I learn there in the stillness? What meditation in making my breath shallow so my parents could not hear it, so their seclusion remained intact, so I could hear them exist without my imposition, without the day begging for attention, its constant wail of need. In that stillness, that listening, I understood how precious how delicate it is to be alive, to carry air and a heartbeat, to relax against your bones. I could ease into that tranquility and find light there. I could find a place for my soul to rest and be at peace. These days, I cling to that memory, the truth of that gentle moment and its harmony. These days, I hold that feeling against the wound my living makes, against the sharp, swift scythe of loved ones lost, of politics making fiction into fact, against the rattle of danger exploding from an angry barrel aimed at my head, my heart. When the darkness comes, I can close my eyes and go right back to the morning whispers over coffee, the sunrise meeting my parents, and the dance of steam from those mugs. The peace there, the way that moment is sealed inside me, the way it protects me still, coating me in my worthiness, bathing me in their love. This is a poem I wrote for the International Peace Conference when it came to Birmingham, and I think it does two things simultaneously. It serves not only as a great introduction to me, I'm a woman who loves her parents more than anything. Just to be near them makes me feel complete. Now that my dad has passed away, finding that place to be near has been hard, but the poems helped me get there. But this poem also touched on the idea, on an idea that I hold dear. The idea that our individual stories and the sharing of those stories through art can make room for empathy and human kindness. In the moment I remembered in this poem, I wanted to settle into stillness and admire the beauty of my parents' uninterrupted existence. Although, yes, I was talking about their morning coffee tradition, I think that that idea, being still, seeing and appreciating another person's existence, or my own, and truly desiring for that other existence, or my own, to be protected, beautiful, and uninterrupted, is what we call empathy. That moment of recognition is where I find poetry. And poetry, on and off the page, is so necessary for our survival, 
for our salvation from the evils of greed, bias, bigotry, hatred, and so many humanitarian crises which we're facing right now. I'd be remiss if I didn't pause here to talk about the idea of poetry as more than just the words on the page. This idea is one I attribute to Audre Lorde, who was a poet, scholar, educator, and activist. Her 1977 speech and essay, Poetry is Not a Luxury, which if you have not read, hasten, please, to that essay and anything she wrote. Um, that essay talks about the necessity of poetry, as she describes it as illumination, revelatory distillation of experience, and a vital necessity for our existence, which forms the quality of light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change, first made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. She says, poetry is a way that we help give name to the nameless so it can be thought. This thing, poetry, can be expressed in words on a page, but it's also that moment of stillness, the moment of empathy for self or others, and that moment when we name the unnameable things inside us and give them room to breathe and become feeling. Maybe that feeling is grief, love, overwhelming surprise at a person's existence which we had not yet considered, desire to make change, a hope for tomorrow. Long before I read Audre Lorde's 1977 essay, I lived the light about which she wrote. Exactly 20 years after that essay's publication in 1997, I discovered what Lorde meant when she called, meant what she called poetry, and it helped me rediscover my voice, my purpose, and my desire to always tell the truth about myself, my history, and the country in which I live. I learned that at the age of seven, when I stood in front of my small, self-contained gifted class and recited the poem Harriet Tubman by Eloise Greenfield, all dressed in white. In that moment, when all my insecurities, yes, at age seven, I had them, I was born a poet, so I had insecurities. When the insecurities began to melt away, I felt something grow within me, or maybe not even grow, but reveal itself from where it had been hiding. I felt empowered in the legacy of a freedom-fighting black woman like Harriet Tubman. I was thrilled by the way Eloise Greenfield's language rolled off my tongue, English brought to life in a way it never had been before. I felt, maybe most of all, glad to know that the racism I'd experienced at the age of five could begin to stop wielding power over me and my self-esteem. If being black meant being a part of Harriet Tubman's story, it was something to celebrate. Those people who saw me as less were wrong. I could be joyful in my identity and in the history of my people. I could live purposefully and happily in poetry. If that isn't something, if that, if that isn't discovering my quality of light, tending to the dark place inside of me, and finding my way to turn silence into thought and action, I don't know what is. That moment changed my life and it was necessary to my survival here on planet Earth, in the United States of America, where I would have, as the years went on, many more encounters with the bigotry which caused me to hide in my shell at five years old. But armed with poetry, I could not only bear witness to those moments, but I could use my words to make those moments known and turn them into empathy-making activist poems which could touch the dark place inside my readers, too. And that, to me, is the necessity of poetry. Yes, we are mirrors to society. We hold the world accountable for its actions. We examine the human condition with the most curious magnifying glasses. But we also create art, art which can find its way into even the darkest places, into the past and its horrors, and into the beating hearts of those living into the present. We are facing a horrifying moment in time. We have faced horrifying moments in time before. Our ancestors know the pain of the past, and we carry that, too. It seems too much to bear. Unfixable by those of us without money and power. Often, people ask me what gives me hope in the world, and other than the young people who always show us the way, it is the willingness of poets to show us a path to our own hearts. 
In everything I do, I keep poetry close. I keep Lord's idea of that light inside as close as I can. In my life as an educator, it is, I believe, my duty to make room for my students and their many identities. It is up to me to lead them as we learn and to make them understand that the classroom is a place where empathy is born, where truth is told, and where each of us is invited to discover what's inside us, what we have to offer to the world. Each semester, I use what I call a feminist pedagogy to create a syllabus which, I hope, reflects all of my students, or at least gives them an experience which demonstrates the many kinds of people who write and live on Earth. I want them to have those moments where they, still and focused, read about others and either see a mirror or a window. Either way, they are open to the idea that we are all a part of each other's story and that honoring and learning from each person's story is what makes room for each of us to be our full, true, uninterrupted selves. In my work as a nonprofit director, I cultivate space each April, so we just survived, April, <laughs> for poets of all stripes to share their work. There is no such thing as a hierarchy of poets or poetry. We all belong. We can all participate in the craft, and we can all share our work. And because my nonprofit, the Magic City Poetry Festival, makes sure that every event is free and open to the public, there is, yet again, a moment for our guests to see a mirror or a window and they come away with more empathy and understanding. And as a poet, it is my goal to write as my most authentic self and make room for others just by showing up as Ashley on the page every time. My favorite writers invited me in by writing their true selves, and I want to pay that forward. So I'm gonna read a few poems. Whenever I speak, I don't just lecture. I love to read poems, because um, that is what I do. I'm also going to mop my brow because it is sweaty up here. I don't know how y'all are feeling. <laughs> I don't know what it's like in the audience, but I feel like I'm in church right now. Um, <laughs> it is, it's warm. Testing my Alabama-ness, for real. So if y'all see me start to go to the side, somebody come get me, <laughs> please. Um, so these poems, which I'm going to read, um, are, I hope, empathy-making and would show you a mirror or a window and either way, allow you to leave feeling like you have permission to feel, question, think, and be your truest self and allow others to do the very same. So first I'll read a poem which deals with history. I truly believe looking honestly at our history through poetry is a great way to sit with the human experience instead of just the black and white photos, the controlled or politicized narratives, or even the fears of those who wish that history to remain buried. This is a poem about Anne Williams. Um, so this poem came out of a collaboration. I've done a lot of collaborations since I've been Poet Laureate, um, which has been really exciting to work with other artists. Um, and this particular one, I don't know when it's coming out. They tell me soon, so whatever that means. Um, but I'm working with this group um, that's making a, or they have made a, an animated musical um, online show which is called The History of White People in America. And the point of the show is to talk about race, the birth of race in America, and race relations throughout time. The first season is all online. It's distributed by um, PBS, so you can look, at, look it up online. Um, so they asked me to write an episode, and write an episode just meant write a poem. They gave me a prompt. The prompt was write about a southern black woman in the 1800s. Super vague prompt. So I was very concerned, what am I going to say? It just so happened that I went to the Legacy Museum, or the, that's what it's called, the Legacy Museum. I, we always just say EJI, but that's not what it is. It's, yeah, y'all know, you're here, you know. I happened to go there, and um, there's always something new to learn every time you go to that museum, as you know, so I noticed a plaque that talked about the domestic slave trade as opposed to the transatlantic. And I never really considered the difference between those two things, because I mean, they both were bad, um, but this mass exodus, or mass selling of enslaved people from the Northeast to the South occurred, and this person who I found, Ann Williams, um, I just kind of Googled after I took that trip, I found Ann Williams' story and I had to write about it. So the short of it is that she was enslaved in Maryland, um, and once you know, it was time for her to be sold South, she was told that her family would be broken up um, completely, 
and um, the auction house that she was um, to be sold at, which was, I think, in D.C., it was three stories high. She was on the third floor, and she walked out of the third floor window. She did survive, um, and many years later, she was able to sue for her freedom, and the lawyer who helped her was Francis Scott Key, whose name is probably familiar to you. So when I read this story, I had to write about it because it's just such an incredible reminder of the horrors of slavery. It's not just a talking point. If someone is moved to literally walk out of a window when faced with the horror of what's going to happen, that lets you know that it wasn't, it wasn't nothing. People may have you believe it was something that was to teach us skills as African people, but that is not true. So this poem um, begins with two epigraphs. The first is from the song, um, All God's Children Got Wings. Anybody heard of it before? I'm not gonna sing it. I like to sing, but I am not a singer. Y'all don't want that. That's not why you brought me here, so I will not do that. But the lyrics um, read, I got wings, you got wings, all of God's children got wings. When I get to heaven, gonna put on my wings. I'm gonna fly all over God's heaven. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Gonna fly all over God's heaven. So that song kind of inspired me um, when I wrote this poem, and here's a quote from Ann Williams. She says, They brought me away with two of my children and wouldn't let me see my husband. They didn't sell my husband, and I didn't want to go. I was so confused and distracted that I didn't know hardly what I was about, but I didn't want to go, and I jumped out of the window. All God's children got wings. When I was born, God gave me wings, feathers fit to fly, the wide breadth of the open sky. When I was born, God said, you are, and I was. This place called Maryland can't own my flesh. This place called America can't own my blood. No master over my love or my womb. No master, no man making devil's deals, no mistress holding her skin above mine, no five flat dollars enough to sell me. They say I'm going south. They can't take us from Africa anymore, so they'll just take us from here. Can the capital's shadow hide this sin? In the south, the sun is mad just like we are. It burns the whole land to spite the men who make us work it. It reminds us that something in this world can be warm. My children are traded for vulgar currency. And I remember God said, you are made of wings. And then I remember the sky, its gift those clouds which they cannot hold, and my soul. I remember that God does not know their names. No slave master will see the pearly gates. And the window, it says, you are. It says, I got wings, feathers fit to fly. When I get to heaven, there'll be no bones to break. No families unglued by the spit of Satan. I'm going to fly all over God's heaven. I'm going to fly. So what happens when we sit with the human truth that Ann Williams saw the open window of a third-story building as the best path forward rather than see her family torn apart and her life's destiny controlled by men, by a system which saw her as nothing close to human? When we look closely, we can see through any argument that tells us American slavery was beneficial to enslaved people. Truly, it wasn't beneficial to anyone. What happens to a person who sees another person as property? What decay begins in the soul? So now I'm gonna go to a personal poem. Um, and I mentioned earlier that I lost my dad three years ago. Our family was very, very, very close. Uh, we're still very close. So the loss of my father, which was extremely unexpected, he was only 59 um, years old when he passed away. 
it really has wrecked all of us. Um, and so I've been writing a lot about him. Um, all these poems that I'm reading are from my forthcoming collection, my fourth book, which is coming out next fall. Um, and a lot of it, as I said, is about grief, personal, political, and um, you know some other emotions that come up while you're in the midst of grief. Um, and so this poem is about a more hopeful moment of my grief so far. Um, so my dad, um, his day job was that he was a fire chief and a paramedic, um, but at home he was the handiest handyman that ever handied. I mean, he could fix every single thing, um, things that he never, like he didn't take classes for it, he just could see something and make it work. And so now that he's gone, we're trying to like fix stuff, which is very impossible. Like <laughs> there's so many things that are so hard to fix. And so there's this thing that's been happening um, I should say too, my dad has the basement totally outfitted with every possible thing you could need to fix anything. So all the stuff is there, we just have to connect the things to the fixing. And so um, we'll you know, be trying to fix something and we can't find a specific part because if you've ever tried to be handy, you know you always need something super specific that you can never find. And once we reach this moment of exhaustion, my mom will literally speak to him aloud. She'll just call his name, Donald, where is it, where is it? And then um, she will also you know, say a prayer She's a black mom, so that means she's also a part-time preacher at the house. Um, and so she'll say a prayer, and after all of that, the thing will appear. So um, the story that really kind of made me believe this was really happening, because I, I haven't always been there to see it happen, but uh, one time I was trying to, recently I was trying to fix our treadmill. Don't recommend, do not fix your own treadmill. Just throw it away, like, <laughs> it's not worth it. Um, but I was trying to change the belt on the treadmill, because my mom works out every single day, and I was like, I'm not gonna let you not have this treadmill. I'm gonna fix it, I'm gonna be just like dad. Cause I'm, I'm a little handy, I'm like 30% handy. Um, and so we spent all day trying to fix this doggone belt and we had to like unscrew something with a socket wrench and I looked through all the socket wrench heads in the basement. Every single one I looked to try to find this one fourth inch head or whatever. If these are not the correct terms, y'all just forgive me. But the thing that goes on <laughs> the stick part and I couldn't find it, couldn't find it. We were exhausted. My mom calls out, Donald, where is it? I know it's here. She says the prayer. I look down into the bag that I have just looked through, every single one, I kid y'all not, and right there is the one-fourth inch socket wrench. And I'm like, well, I'll be darned. There it is. So I've been trying to find ways to still be in a relationship with my dad, even though his body is not here with me. And these moments are just really helpful Regardless of what you may believe is happening, it's helpful to me to believe that he is from the beyond helping us still. So this poem is about that. Grief Interlude 4. A socket wrench, a tail light bulb, a screw. The ringing red blare of a fire truck when I need to know you're there. When this new version of you reminds me it's not luck that we find everything we need. All tools appear when we, exhausted, call your name into the broken treadmill, the black spool of tire losing air. You are the same in death as in life. You fix everything. You provide. You, spine of our family, still show up in spirit, soul, you still bring us comfort, guidance, proof of God's beauty. Although we're unassembled by your death, you build us back, you whisper without breath. So the last poem that I will leave you with, um, and I don't know if we have time or want to do questions, but I'm happy to do that after I finish this poem. The last poem, I should have said, the one I just read was a sonnet. There are sonnet police everywhere, so that was a sonnet. It has all the syllables, it has the, it's got it all. There are truly sonnet police. Y'all think I'm kidding, but there really are people who will just waste everybody's time. Like, that's not a real sonnet. Why does that matter to you? Anyway, this is a real one. Um, but this next one is not a sonnet. Um, it's a poem about God. Um, so I was very fortunate to be raised in a household which taught me that God is bigger than anything humans can dream of, that we all take different paths and every path is to be honored. There is more to life and to service of God than creating division, hatred, and a hellscape of greed on earth. So this poem begins with two um, epigraphs. The first is from the Bible. 
um, Psalm 121, My Help Comes from the Lord. And the other is from a poem by my friend, Basil Mohuddin, um, a great poet. If you're looking for contemporary poets to read, he's truly amazing, um, Chicago-based poet. And his poem, which is called Allah Castles, he's a Muslim poet, the quote from that that I wanted to use for an epigraph is, God is God is God. He's very big into interfaith, as you may be able to tell. This poem is called, When You Ask Me From Where My Help Comes. The face of God was shown to my people in the dark and vast nighttime sky, in a town just like this one some four centuries ago. It does not matter where in this country you are. My people were there, and they searched for God who they knew before the sin of those ships. God is God, no matter the continent. The stars are windows to heaven. We can follow them to glory, and so can you. Do you think the face of God is a human face? How can something as big, as world-making, as ocean-building, as mountain-moving, as look how this earth knows to keep spinning, be contained by such inconsequential instruments as skin and bones. God wears many faces, all of them you and all of them me, all of them, all of us, always. A face as singular and as varied as all the spears of grass making a whole holy green. It's true, my people saw the face of God and it looked like the cool river opening up to welcome their feet, to erase their scent as they were hunted by people who maybe were our great-great-great-grandfathers and their sons, by the dogs which did nothing but what they were told. The face of God in the sunlight warming the backs of ants as they build their hallways made of earth, grain by grain. The face of God in the owl's haunt, in the space between our palms as they meet in prayer. The face of God in our prayers, in the breath on our anxious and grateful lips, in the many names by which we call God, in all the languages made for us to speak. God in truth, unmitigated, painful, and real. God sees us now. What will we show him? Thank you all very much. don't have to. I'll say that. <laughs> it's also fine. Oh, the episode? Um, so it'll air online first. So the channel you should look for, ooh, I may get this wrong. Um, if you just search the title, The History of White People in America, it'll take you to their YouTube channel. I think it's like the World YouTube channel. Um, and it'll have all those episodes from season one. My episode, they say that it may be coming out in the fall, um, and I'm not exactly sure where or how yet. Um, we're still going through animations, but it looks really awesome so far. I'm very excited about that. Yes, I was. No, no. It does, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I didn't learn to be afraid of what I was saying until I was in high school. When I started writing poetry, I was seven years old, as I, as I said. So the day that I recited this poem to my class, I had this just like spiritual experience. It was amazing. I went home to my spy journal. So I loved Harriet the Spy. And I literally would spy on my family because I'm weird. I'm a poet. We're just made a little differently. Um, and I started writing poetry in that book, and it was kind of what you hear from me today. It was about 
um, civil rights and how everybody should be equal and sometimes about God, about my family, about nature, just really very Ashley Jones poems back then. But it really wasn't until I started um, studying poetry, um, I guess professionally, I went to the School of Fine Arts in Birmingham, and it wasn't until I was in a room with other writers and noticing, you know, this person's getting more contest wins than me, or this person is more popular. And in my case, I was, um, for a while, the only black person or person of color in my class. And that did matter because sometimes there were reactions to my poems which were just out of a difference of culture and they didn't really know how to communicate that well. So I took it very personally and was like, well, I can't write like that. I gotta write like them to be you know, normal. And so I really stepped away from my true self to fit in. And of course I was a teenager, so they're doing that anyway. But when I got to college was when I really got reinvigorated to be myself. Um, and that had a lot to do with just having teachers who supported my unique voice. Um, and so I haven't felt that fear in a while just because I know, I know the power of speaking your truth. And yes, it can sometimes be scary to walk into a room and, like this one and read to people. Like, that's the scary part for me. Publishing, I don't care who in the world reads, you know, my stuff. But showing up in front of real humans looking at you, you know, and not knowing what they're going to think, that part is kind of scary. But what helps me um, is really believing in my work and knowing that it is my authentic truth and all the facts that I'm using are verifiable, you know. That helps me feel empowered. Um, and I would say, even if you don't want to be a writer, like I know you said some of your students do want to do it, and it's, I mean, that's a whole other conversation about the craziness of being in the writing industry. Even if you don't want to be a writer, I really do believe that everyone should try to have some kind of writing practice, even if it's just a little note here and there sometimes. A journal, that's great. Everybody should write something down, you know, about what they're thinking, because it really does help you process, and it does give you kind of some space to step back and reconsider yourself or something that's going on. Um, even if in your workplace you have to respond to somebody, I would say write it down first before you press send because that'll help you. It'll just help you step back and see yourself. I don't know if I'm answering your question at all, but um, if there's more. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so funny enough, when I was in that high school I just told um, Lynn about, I was so against poetic form, like I literally evangelized against it, um, which is a weird thing to be passionate about, but as a teenager I was like, there's no point to this, it's so old, it's so this, it's so that. It took me a few years, you know, once I um, got to grad school, really, and I learned about form as a useful tool to help support the content. That's kind of when I started to see how it could work in my poetry. Um, and also just reading poets other than Shakespeare, no shade to Shakespeare at all, have no beef with Shakespeare at all. But just hearing other people using forms is helpful, especially when you're younger, you can't always relate um, to some of the older texts. So that's another just thing, teach living poets or living whoever you're teaching, throw some living people in there. Um, but for me, when I look at a poem or when I'm starting to write a poem, either the form will already be in my mind or the poem will tell me this is not the right form. You know, So if, so for example, with that um, sonnet that I read today about my dad, these grief interludes have been kind of hard to write because there's so much I want to say. And so often I've had to try to um, kind of condense myself. Um, and a sonnet is one of my favorite forms because it always forces me to say what I'm trying to say quickly. And it usually allows me to have a revelation by that last couplet. Um, sometimes I like to do things with um, literally the visual space on the page. So I've done some concrete poems um, where they're in a certain um, shape or I've used, I have a poem that's um, a geometric proof, which is exciting to me. I loved those. Nobody else seems to have loved those at all, but I really did. And I saw another poet do it, um, Morris Manning, um, in his book, Lawrence Booth's Book of Visions, has a proof poem. And I kept that in my mind since I read it in high school, and I said I have to try to use this. And that poem, the, f the proof seemed perfect because I was writing about Moses in the Red Sea, and I wanted to challenge myself to see if I could 
mathify or like um, prove something that's unprovable. So sometimes it's like a game, you know, where you're trying to see what the poem can do on the page, use the whole page, um, you know, not just the one little column, but words could go anywhere. Um, so sometimes the poem will tell me this is, needs to be shorter, it needs to be a haiku series, or um, I'll have an idea that I really wanna work with a sestina form, and so I try to find a topic that'll fit. But now I really see form as something that's, that gives me a lot of freedom, because the poem, the words itself aren't the only thing that are giving meaning. The actual form is helping with that as well. Um, and it can be a great place to start if people don't write already, giving them rules I found, especially with my science students, I have like a million pre-med students at UAB, and I just finished a semester of writing, and giving them rules really helped them, because otherwise the blank page is just like yelling at them, you know. Um, so that, yeah, I love form now. My teenage self is just horrified to hear this coming out of my mouth, but <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Any others? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are good questions. So as far as the process goes, I'm really led by the poems. Um, and what I mean by that is I try, how do I want to say, I try to just let whatever peaks my poem making spot I, let, I go with that. So I just live a normal life. I read things, I see things, whatever. And whatever is something that I'm like processing or can't process without really typing it out and figuring it out on the page or um, a memory or an experience that is really just kind of not leaving me alone, that's usually when I know it's time to write. And often for me, I will like see the poem in my mind. I'll either see like the first line or the last line or I'll, I'll kind of see what message or what emotion is guiding the poem, or I'll see the literal shape if I'm making a shape, um, or I'll hear some sort of turn of phrase, and that's kind of my signal, get to the page, get it down. Um, as far as messages, I think more than anything, I'm just trying to tell the truth, whether that's about me or about my culture or about what's happening in the world. That is my goal always. Um, so it's not necessarily, how do I say, people, people will usually think that p poets who are political are just ready to beat somebody over the head. Not at all. I'm presenting information and how it has impacted me. So the way that I wrote the Ann Williams poem, for example, is how I experienced reading that history. Um, just trying to put myself in her shoes to think about what would it mean to walk out of this third story window. Um, so as far as a message, the, the biggest message I hope people get is that I am a human, or whoever I'm writing about are human beings. And you can find commonality in that some way. And I do think, as I said, that poetry, art in general, but poetry specifically, does seem to allow people a way in where other things may not. So like if I were a politician, for example, you're already turned off because I'm a politician. You know, I have an agenda. But as a poet, I'm interested in the human experience. And we are all human beings, so there's like kind of an easier way to talk about some of those more difficult things. Um, there was another part of your question, emotional something. Yes. Yeah, I think, I'm thinking right now about some of my most, yeah, yeah. Yes. I do hope for that, I really do, especially, well, in any poem, but certainly the ones which are sort of tackling difficult subjects, and even in these ones now about grief, which is a difficult subject, I am hoping that people feel less alone or they feel open to understanding someone else's experience. That is definitely a goal of mine um, in everything I do, but definitely in my poetry as well.
Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, that's not where I thought you were going at all. <laughs> you scared me. <laughs> I was very nervous. Um, no, no, it's okay. Um, I think I have so much I want to say about this particular topic. So I mentioned that I was raised in a pretty, like, peace-loving household, you know. I obviously lived in the Deep South, you know, I'm from here. And so it's not always normal to accept everybody's religion or to not say you're going to hell if you're not, you know, in the Baptist church every Sunday. But that's how I was raised. Um, I was raised Christian, but my parents always said, you know, this is just our path. You do not put down anybody else's path because we're not God. We don't know, you know, how people can access him. And so I've always felt like it was so simple, you know, and that we just make things so complicated. And we do use things like God to fuel so many hateful um, actions. And so what I would say to that is, I think God can be an answer if people are listening for actual God and not whatever man-made, you know, divisions have been created in God's name. If people are truly just seeking some sort of love and peace, some spirit, you know, in that, in that vein for themselves, then maybe that will help us, you know, see others as people. Um, and if people believe that God created us all, if we just believe that, I think that could solve a lot. You know, it seems like we're not quite there, you know, yet. Um, but I, I'm not, I definitely will not be someone to say, you know, you have to do this exact thing to like reach heaven. I'm not in heaven, so I can't tell you, you know, what's up there. Hope I make it. Um, but I do think that if people um, see that God is in everything and everyone, and my poetry, I think, at least does that. Some of my friends also write about their faith. Um, that's one reason why I'm so big on interfaith dialogue. My friend Fassel, who I mentioned, um, is a Muslim poet. He writes about God. And for people to see the two of us who don't share the same faith, finding commonality in that we both love God and peace, you know, I feel like that could be an example um, in some way. Um, I don't know. I also am kind of a misanthrope, so I feel like we're sometimes beyond saving as humans, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> oh, well, hopefully it was a satisfactory answer, um, but I have no problem talking about that. If you had asked me some other deeply personal, you know, question, we would have had a different experience, I think. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, okay, first part was the hope piece, okay. right, okay. Right, right, right. So I think, um, so maybe two things I'll say. First, for me, um, seeing that poets are committed to calling these things out, that does give me hope that we're not tired, you know, of even though, yes, it's the same thing over and over, the fact that we still feel empowered and energized to um, highlight what's going on, um, to document it for future generations in the hope that they would see like, oh, I've seen this before, maybe we should do something about it. Um, that does give me some hope, but also that poets usually um, will find some beautiful piece of humanity even in the horrible things that are happening. Um, you know, just some little nugget to remind us that there is goodness still, even through all of these horrible things that are happening. Um, and I think poetry, poetry does seek those moments, you know, where in the midst of all the chaos, 
there's still a flower to grow or a child smiling or you know something beautiful um, something beautiful to experience solidarity um, I think I think as far as solidarity goes um, poets who decide to speak up that is a brave thing you know I know I said earlier I don't care who reads I do <laughs> I definitely do care um, but it, it does matter for poets to speak on what's happening and that is I think solidarity um, to not pretend that things are not you know happening at all and it can be difficult to speak on certain issues we all live here so we know how it is you know sometimes you feel um, like something will be jeopardized if you stand in solidarity um, but also I think as poets um, and teachers sharing and teaching other people's poems um, who are speaking to a moment that's also useful so even if you don't write poems or even if like say I'm I feel like I can't speak to a certain um, crisis because I don't know everything about what's happening I can find somebody who does know what's happening and make sure I'm teaching that poem and sharing it with people um, supporting that poet bringing that poet to read it's another way to show some solidarity if you know there's something happening and there's a poet from that uh, place or um, who's experiencing that issue bring them to your campus <laughs> you know have them to speak um, to show them that you're proud of what they're doing and that you support what they're doing um, but also I think poetry can be activism as well all the work that I um, talked about with empathy making that to me is an activist um, act you know to to try to make someone or try to lead someone into um, reconsidering their views on someone or something that is very important um, and there's fronts everywhere not everyone is on the front lines of every march or um, you know speaking up to um, the impenetrable government some people are in the classroom teaching about these things or um, sharing work or writing work all of that matters because anyone whose heart can be opened is a victory I think um, Yeah, um, so other than me, I would say um, there's a poet in Montgomery, from Montgomery, named Jacqueline Trimble, um, and her work is, very, she's at ASU, her work is very um, clear and radical and accessible, and she talks about these everyday moments where, you know, we're just like, I exist, like, why is this such a threat to you <laughs> that I exist? Um, she has a poem, um, at a publication called Salvation South, and I, I'm not gonna remember the whole name because it's a very long title, but it's about, um, uh, it's when Florida started passing all of their situation. Um, she's replying directly to that. Jacqueline Trimble. Mm -hmm. No, honestly, I don't. Um, which is not because I'm in an echo chamber exactly, but I really don't know any poets because you, how do I say, it's hard to be a poet for real and not see the like nuance of a situation. Like if you're really poeming for real, for real, it's hard to be like, yeah, we should never teach your history. Like, you know, okay. Oh, oh, yeah. No, I, I Jackie would go for that too. Um, who else would I recommend? I mean, there are a lot of us who write about our history in the hopes that it will stay alive. So I would even recommend, one of my favorites is Patricia Smith. She's a living poet um, in, she's not still in Chicago, but she's from Chicago. Um, and she does write a lot about um, social justice. Um, yeah, as far as the literal moment right now, I'm sure those poems are being published, you know, everywhere, but there's not, I can't think of like a, a whole book or, um, except for Jackie's poem that I know is directly aimed at um, the Florida government. And then I have um, a poem about critical race theory also. I'm a little blank right now, but I would, if you're around later, I'll try to think of some more and give you a list of poets just to check out um, who are talking about that.
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, so, yeah, so that book has definitely been one um, where the title alone has <laughs> been like, people have been nervous. Um, so the book was not even called that at first. It was like a last minute change, actually. Um, I realized that all the poems in the book were sort of speaking to this idea of repairing. Um, and I wrote the title poem almost last. I think it was one of the last poems that I wrote. And it came to me in the way that I told, uh, I think I was answering your question before, where I was getting ready to teach, just normal, getting ready to teach. Um, I was teaching John Lewis's March books, and I realized that my students just did not have a connection to 1963, because they are so young, you know, they just don't have the same foundation um, as I do with, you know, those images. So I was like, well, let me get some context together. So I pulled up George Wallace's video, um, or his video of the inauguration speech where he says segregation now tomorrow forever and something said to me you should read that whole speech and I never had done so because I really didn't want to frankly <laughs> you know it was not interesting to me but I listened um, and read the whole speech and as I was reading it at my desk I just kept like underlining things and saying wait a minute this sounds kind of familiar this sounds kind of familiar and it dawned on me um, and I already knew this but just seeing seeing it written this way, um, or seeing it in black and white ink, that some of these ideas are recycled, of course, and that was in 2016 or 17 that I wrote this poem, so you know where I'm going. There were a lot of um, those same sort of feelings uh, bubbling up, so I wanted to write the poem to show that these things are cyclical, this is not you know, a new idea, and we do need to start repairing. We are owed at least that, um, the repair of the divide between so many of us here in America, but also the repair of what was broken um, from my people. I mean, there's undeniable brokenness um, from slavery um, and just so many things that have yet to be addressed. So once I wrote that poem, I looked back through all the rest and I said, okay, well, everything else is kind of speaking to the same idea that we all need repair, reparations for not just political situations, so I'm talking about black people, needing it, but also I had a lot of personal poems where I'm asking for something back that I felt had been stolen from me, even in like relationships. So getting my time back or my ability to trust back, all of that is a reparation, uh, something that is repair, would be repaired or given back. Um, and so that's kind of how the title came about. Um, I have both political poems and personal poems and they all kind of speak to that same idea. So that's how it happened. Turned out to be a very catchy title. So <laughs> yeah, no problem. Oh Lord, it was terrible. Um, um, I think it was Glory Hallelujah. Cause I was like, well, my first book was Magic City Gospel. Maybe my third book can like come back to that idea. And that's not a bad phrase. It just didn't, it was doing too much. It was too cute, you know, I think um, for what was happening in the book. <laughs> 